Hi everyone, this is a short presentation on the ultrasound of soft tissues for those of you who are studying Clinimag 720. It is rare for a day to go by without a referral for palpable lump query. Ultrasound is routinely used to evaluate palpable soft tissue masses. Traditionally, MRI and CT have been used. However, ultrasound is becoming the preferred modality for evaluation of these pathologic soft tissue conditions. There's many advantages of ultrasound, including the fact that it is readily available and very cost effective. Also, the ability to take a clinical history and examine the patient while you're doing the scan is really um, makes it a lot easier to work out what um, is actually happening. The request forms often provide unreliable or inadequate information and just talking to the patient obviously can elicit a lot more information. Also by using dynamic ultrasound, i.e. like moving the patient, compressing the lesion, using muscle contraction, we can actually work out a lot more of what is going on, where the structure is lying. Ultrasound also enables the identification of subtle calcification that you can't see on MRI. And also it's a quick, easy way of evaluating for lesional vascularity. What is the role of ultrasound? It's to provide information about the extent of a mass, its nature and its relationship to the surrounding structures. Ultrasound differentiates cystic from solid masses, determines whether there's pseudotumors or true, true masses. Whether this, if it is a solid mass, does it need further investigation, i.e. aspiration, biopsy? Some of the things that we've got to assess when we're evaluating a soft tissue mass, looking at the size, we've got to measure the, the mass in three different planes. We've got to assess the margins. Is it ill-defined or is it well-defined? The echo pattern, is it hypoechoic? Is it hyperechoic? Is it homogeneous? Is it heterogeneous? Is this mass vascular or not? Can we identify small calcifications or large calcifications within the mass? Is the mass compressible? Is it not compressible? And really important, we need to be able to dis describe the location of where we see the mass. Technique. Examination technique is important. Transducer. Obviously, most of the time that we're going to be looking for soft tissue masses, we're going to be looking in the near field. So we're going to be able to use high frequency transducers. Usually, um, we're going to be looking at um, linear transducers for these high frequency linear transducers and quite often when we're looking at um, small parts like fingers and toes and hands and feet even ankles we use it like a small hockey stick transducer the important thing here i want to talk about is when you hold the transducer make sure you hold it at its footprint and anchor the probe to the patient with the side of your hand or fingers this helps stabilize the transducer and allows for little fine movements this also will help to assess how much pressure you're actually pl placing on the transducer. If you use excessive pressure, you might actually obscure the margins of a soft tissue mass or compress the fluid component so that you don't think there's any fluid there. Ideally, you sort of need to do a variety of probe um, pressures so that you can actually compress to see whether the um, tissue is compressible, whether there's fluid and things like that. Also, really important to have a thick layer of gel. Sometimes when you've got a really, really, um, really um, superficial mass and you've got a, um, or you're looking to see whether there's any um, soft tissue swelling, you need to actually just balance the transducer really, really delicately on a big, huge glob of gel. Um, also, um, avoid heavy pressure when you're performing a Doppler examination. If you've got vascular, um, that's vascular in a small soft tissue structure, these vessels are going to be really, really tiny. So they might be actually effaced or they reduced the um, Doppler signal when you compress the um, structure too hard. I've just put a wee note in here, um, panorama and trapezoid. They're just two different imaging techniques that we quite often use in soft tissue. Panorama um, just gives us an extended field of view that we can um, look at when we're trying to measure a big a large hematoma or a large mass in a superficial structure trapezoid is just that um is again we can extend the field of view you do lose a little bit of lateral resolution but it can be really useful soft tissue pathology so when we're doing um looking at soft tissue masses the main pathology that we're looking for are inflammatory masses 
traumatic masses, the, the um, malignant soft tissue masses like sarcomas, we can get benign soft tissue tumours like lipomas, also non-tumorous masses, bursa, ganglion, cysts, we've got looking for lymphadenopathy, sometimes we see soft tissue metastases which are rare but we do see them and sometimes it's actually just normal tissue that we're looking at. First of all we're just going to um, just re review the normal soft tissue appearances. The first layer that we see is the dermis which is two layers that appear together as a thin hyperechoic layer. Deep to this is the subcutaneous layer. This is hypoechoic with two main components, hypoechoic fat interspersed with hyperechoic linear echoes running mostly parallel to the skin, representing the connective tissue septa. Deep to this is the linear hyperechoic layer. This is, record, this is called the fascia, and the thickness, the thickness of this varies depending upon the location. Then below that there is the muscle, which is the hypoechoic cylindrical structures with hyperechoic connective tissue surrounding them. That's the pyramysium. Incidence of skin and soft tissue infections has increased dramatically in recent years. The most common infections that we encounter in clinical practice are cellulitis and abscesses. Distinction between the two is crucial in choosing the appropriate therapy. Cellulitis is treated with systemic antibiotics, whilst the um, abscess is treated by incision and draining. Therefore, obviously, you, do not want, you want to make sure that you get those two correct. Distinction by clinical assessment alone can be really challenging for even the most experienced physician and ultrasounds are shown to be a really highly sensitive tool. Um, okay, cellulitis here. So the appearance of cellulitis varies depending on the stage and severity. So initially at the beginning here, you can see this is, this is your initial cellulitis. There's generalized swelling and increased echogenicity of the skin here, the dermis here, it's a lot more brighter and sort of it's quite ill-defined really, and also the subcutaneous tissues. Then as we go along to further on progression here, we've got a amount of subcutaneous fluid here. So we can see the fluid in here separated with hyperechoic fat lobules. So those fat lobules here are now becoming quite hyperechoic. So you can see this sort of appearance here, which is commonly referred to as the cobblestone appearance. Just remember that this appearance is actually not specific. And you can also get generalized skin um, subcutaneous edema for thing, from things like CHF and things like that. So we need to make sure where there's some inflammation and sometimes it's just correlation with the clinical symptoms as well. Just some case studies here. So we've got an 80 year old who prevented with a painful swollen, swollen leg following a squamous cell biopsy here. So here what we've got here, we've got those hyperechoic fat lobules separated by the hypoechoic fluid in here. Possibly a little bit of increased um, vascularity just in here. Little wee bright white punctate echoes. That could possibly represent gas from an abscess or something or from the um, biopsy. Next one here we've got an elderly man who's got diffuse swelling of his right forearm. This chap here had um, a blood test and this um, this was the result after his blood test. Looking at the bottom images here, we can see a linear um, thickened vein here with some hollow debris and things in it here, thrombus in here. And there's the transverse view of that there. Importantly here, we've done a compression comparison. So here's the vein here and here. And so it's a non-compressible vein. So this is this is consistent with a superficial thrombophlebitis with associated cellulitis. So that's what we need to be reporting, that there is a superficial thrombophlebitis with associated cellulitis. Okay, abscess. An abscess may present as a soft tissue mass, although typically the clinical signs of infection, such as erythema, warmth, tenderness, and elevated white blood cell counts sort of are present and sort of a quite typical to, um, presentations for that. Ultrasound's effective in identifying an extremity abscess, especially when it's superficial. However, sometimes the deep infections can sometimes be more problematic and require MRI. So ultrasound, they're most commonly a hypoechoic and heterogeneous. 
Um, a very purulent abscess may have numerous internal echoes and may be isoechoic or slightly hyperechoic to the surrounding soft tissue. So here you can see this one here, in this case here, it's quite isoechoic, sort of hyperechoic with the surrounding tissue. And sometimes you can see some posterior through tran transmission here. With these abscesses here, it's really important here to use that trans um, drusa, drusa compression and see if you can see the actual movement of the debris and the pus and things moving around in that abscess. Okay, traumatic injuries. We can have foreign bodies, we can have hematomas, and we can have fat necrosis. Here we've got our good old foreign body here, which we see multitudes of times. These can be really hard to scan or they can be hard to find, I apologise, because come sometimes they're not actually very um, very large, they're quite small and they're not the angle that they've entered into the skin isn't parallel to the skin. So you've got to actually make sure you use heel toe and come from different directions and so sort of spend quite a lot of time. They can take quite a lot of time to find these little wee splinters um, and, and sort of um, interrogating from different angles of the um, the skin surface to try and find them. Also here a note, make sure that you extend the study to a larger area than close to the wound because sometimes those fragments migrate away from the entrance point as a result of the repeated muscle contraction. So look for some, when you're trying to find some, to just to try and get a, um, th these sort of things might highlight the fact that there is a splinter there. You might see some posterior acoustic shattering or comet tail artifact. Sometimes you see the hypoechoic halo, you see a hypoechoic area before you actually see the splinter. So you can hear, you can be scanning here and you see this hypoechoic sort of superficial mass and you think, oh gosh, and then when you see, you think, oh, there could be something there and you turn the, the um, the transducer 90 degrees and you can see the um, see the actual um, splinter sitting in there, the foreign body there. As a Steve Moore cartoon states, mutilate, mangle, crush, pound, slam, all for the game. This results in many soft tissue injury referrals. Here's one here. So this patient here was a 23 year old who received several blows to the left quadriceps following a rugby game and was unable to weight bear. On this ultrasound here, you can see a 30 millimeter wide by 40 to 5 to sort of 50 millimeter long mass in this distal third of the thigh, just to the junction between the rectus femoris and the vastus medialis. It's got internal um, characteristics, so they're sort of quite complex with mixed echogenic and hypoechoic areas. You can sort of see sort of quite clumpy sort of areas here, which are quite sort of looking quite dense in actual fact. There's a little bit of vascularity noted within. So these are all, all sort of characteristics of a solid lesion um, as opposed to, to a cystic sort of area. This was actually, in fact, myositis ossificans. So sometimes you need to do x-rays to prove that these, these are calcifying. Main thing here is to make sure that you actually note um, and, and work out when we talked about on that first slide about location. So you actually need to be able to work out not only is there a complex solid mass within this thigh, um, you need to say where it is. So this one here is at the junction between the rectus femoris and the vastus mediatus. Okay, so this chap here had a fall from his bicycle six months previously. There was numerous injuries. He had fractured clavicle and all sorts of other things and now presented with a persistent painless lump over his left greater trochantic region. And this what here is a moral lovely injury here. So this is a um, there's sort of like an oval um, hypoechoic mass here. You can just see it here, lying between the subcutaneous tissues here and the deep fascia. So this we were needing to know where um, in fact it is. So it's it's not in the muscle. So we know that it's not in the muscle. Here's that fascia, and here's the superficial tissue. So we, we've got this mass in between those two structures here. It's superficial to the greater trochanter here, so we need to say here's the greater trochanter here, here's this mass here, so here's, here's the subcutaneous tissue, here's the fascia here, um, ITB is just coming in here. So this is a post-traumatic seroma, it's a closed degloving sort of soft, injury, soft tissue injury, it results from abrupt separation of the skin and subcutaneous tissue from underlying fascia, you can understand if you come off your bike and your, your um, side of your leg hits the pavement and the, um, you get this sort of really closed degloving injury. 
So the collection typically intervenes between the deep layer of the subcutaneous tissue and the fascia. So it's a result of that shear strain mechanism that I was just talking about, which causes disruption of that rich vascular plex um, plexus that um, pierces the fascia um, latte. Lat lat latte? Yeah, it's a latte. Um, need a coffee, obviously. Initial space is filled with various types of fluid ranging from serous fluid to frank blood and the collection sometimes that may spontaneously resolve or become encapsulated which this one you can see has become encapsulated. Um, conservative treatments really successful though so these ones quite often go on for surgical drainage resection and um, they sort of take a wee while to actually sort of um, to, to fix up. Tumours and tumour-like conditions. So we've got a, there's a large variety of um, lesions that we can get. Some have got calcifications. We we can see trof, um, trophaceous gout or rheumatoid nodules. We can see sebaceous epidermoid cysts, lipomas, vascular malformations, mets, and malignant masses. So just remember that most malignant masses are predominantly hypoechoic. They usually got low level echoes or heterogeneity and are well defined as they have a, like a pseudo capsule. As a malignant mass enlarges, especially if it's a high grade, it becomes more heterogeneous with hypoechoic areas of internal necrosis and increased flow and colour Doppler. So this is where we are talking to the patient that you actually need to um, have a discussion with them and find out how long they've had the mass, whether it's changed, whether it's grown quickly, whether it comes and goes. So it's these sorts of things are really, really important for the differential diagnosis when you're looking at masses. Okay. So it's a real, really a critical distinction to determine, to determine where, whether the mass originates from a synovial space. So that's in the joint, in the bursa or a tendon sheath. The main thing is that these masses are likely to be benign and related to a synovial process. So here you can see a ganglion. This is one that we scan all the time, that little ganglion lump in the wrist there. You can see it here. It looks like a little comma, really, the ganglions, and they sort of stem from the... You can either see them coming from the joint with their little neck coming down to the joint or onto the tendon sheath. So this is the most common mass or lump in the wrist or hand that we see. Histologically they have a thin connective tissue capsule but no true synovial lining. They contain mucinous material so with a gelatinous fluid so they're not usually high they're not usually anechoic they've usually got sort of little particulate material that we can see in there. So most, um, most are complex and have well-defined margins, thick walls, Quite often they have locules as well as acoustic enhancement. And just to try and work out when you're scanning these whether they're attached to the joint capsule or to the tendon. Okay, this is one that again that we see all the time, especially because we're supposed to be looking for these when we're looking for DBTs and things. So these sort of can cause swelling and pain of the lower leg. So this is a baker's cyst here, and it's a fluid-filled distended synovial lined bursa. Again, it's a comma-shaped cyst with its characteristic neck arising between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the semimembranous tendons via communication with the knee joint. So quite often you'll see a little neck here coming down to the actual knee joint. The cyst may be filled with solid synovial tissue and can be inflammatory. So it's quite often got um, particulate material and things that we can move around and you can actually see sometimes you'll see septations and loculations within it. Okay, lipomas. So these are really, really common. It's the most common soft tissue tumour that we see. Prevalence of about 2% and account for probably half of all our soft tissue um, masses. And often we, we see them because patients lose weight. They're a benign tumour of um, mature adipocytes. Um, malignant transformation is absolutely non-existent. Okay, So typically they're compressible. So this is where we've got to be using our technique. So we're going to compress these there to see whether they are compressible and we will report that they're compressible or non-compressible in the report. Okay, They're palpable soft tissue masses in the subcutaneous tissue, and they're not adherent with the overlying skin. Okay, So they're separate from the dermis, they're in the subcutaneous tissue, um, although sometimes you can actually get intramuscular or intermuscular deep lipomas, deep lipomas. however they are a bit less common to see. Um, when scanning these, quite often you actually have to use your left hand to um, palpate where the lipoma is and sort of put your fingers at either edge of the um, the mass and then put the transducer in between that to sort of try and work out exactly where the mass is because they're quite um, hard to see sometimes. Um, the most often solitary oval or rounded mass but sometimes they can actually be multiple. 
So usually superficial life poems are typically elliptical, well circumscribed, pliable and avascular. They often demonstrate short linear reflective striations that run parallel to the skin. Okay, so remember when we were looking at that um, initial um, image of normal tissue, we showed the subcutaneous tissue and it had those connective tissue running parallel to the skin. It's really important that we look for those striations parallel um, because we know then that it is um, just the subcutaneous tissue there. Now the echogenicity can be variable. Sometimes they're hypoechoic. They can range between hypoechoic to hyperechoic relative to the subcutaneous fat. But important here, they remain homogeneous. Okay, so here's a lipoma here. Pretty subtle to see really, isn't it? But it has sort of got a capsule. So this is this lipoma just sitting in here within the, the subcutaneous tissue here. This one here is another case here. So this is a 60-year-old woman who had a palpable lump on the right upper back. Um, on ultrasound, it was a 55 millimeter mobile sort of um, mass. And you could see a fine echogenic capsule. Again, you could see that although it was homogeneous, it's got those fine reflective striations running parallel to the skin. This is when we talked about the trapezoid function, so we can get the whole mass on there. This one here, the depth could have been possibly reduced here, so we could actually see... Um, we want to demonstrate that it's in the subcutaneous tissue and not in the muscle. So we've seen the muscle here, but the, um, it could have been reduced in depth to get better imaging for that there. Um, this one here has got better depth. Here we can see here. So this is a 45-year-old woman. The masseuse, she's having a massage and they noticed a large soft lump. She had no discomfort. This is on her back, apologies. Um, the ultrasound demonstrated a really well-defined elliptical compressible soft tissue mass within the subcutaneous tissue. Okay, um, here's the, here we've got here, remember this is the fascia here, and this is the subcutaneous tissue here. Okay, so you've got the short um, linear reflective striations running parallel to the skin here. We know that this is a lipoma here. Okay, so this one here is, next is vascular malformations or hemangioma. Um, they're always called hemangiomas, but the newer nomenclature says it calls them slow flow venous malformations. However, I put a wee note there that sometimes it's useful to include hemangioma in the report because the term's ubiquitous in the literature and, and sort of most familiar to many clinicians. Um, these vascular malformations may show no Doppler flow until compressed. And so sometimes when you compress these um, vascular malformations, they don't. Um, when you release the transducer pressure off, then you get the um, seat of the vascular, vascular there because the blood returns after the compression is released. So normally they're sort of an abnormal heterogeneous area replacing the normal muscle with vascular channels, um, hyperechoic fat and possible phlebolifts that cause shadowing. Um, confirmation with MRI is usually indicated for these because um, MRI is more accurate at assessing the extent and the character of the abnormality than ultrasound. It's sort of quite a... Um, ill-defined sort of hypoechoic mass, so it's quite hard to differentiate which one it is. So here's an image of a of some different um, hemangiomas here. So you can see how it's sort of quite ill-defined and it's sort of um, hypoechoic, but again it looks sort of quite heterogeneous with some sort of cysticky sort of areas in it here. Again we've got another one here, a hemangioma sitting just in here and some vascular hemangioma there. So they're quite ill-defined and um, can be sort of um, hard to know exactly um, what that is. So the MRI is more useful there. This one here, we've got a mass here. Important, where is this located? It's not in the dermis here, is it? It's not there. It's not in the subcutaneous tissue. Here's the fascia here. It's not in the fascia. This is intramuscular here. This one here, you can see it's sort of it's sort of really well, relatively well defined. But still, some of the posterior margins here are pretty poorly defined. Quite vascular here. This is just an eight-month-old lump in the left back here. So the, due to the vascularity and it being intramuscular, this could be anything from a sarcoma to a benign vascular malformation. So this is why these ones here, they definitely, definitely need an MRI because we could easily call that a sarcoma or a hemangioma. This one here, we've got a sort of a well-defined compressible 20 millimeter heterogeneous hypoechoic mass. Again, there looks like some vascularity. We've got some vascularity in here. We've got some Doppler here. This is in the postparietal area of a, a wee three week old female. 
Um, it's moderately vascular with arterial feeders and venous flow. It sort of abuts the surface of the... Um, another thing we sometimes see is epidermal inclusion cysts. So these de derive from focal proliferation of epidermal cells within the subcutaneous tissue, i.e. they're located in the epidermis. So the causes can be embryonic, they can be traumatic, or they can be secondary to surgical procedures. Usually a unilocular cyst lined by squamous cells and filled with a white cheesy material reflecting the layers of the keratin and the cholesterol-rich debris. Usually they present as slow-growing, freely mobile lumps beneath the skin. Um, usually no Doppler, they don't have Doppler flow either. Here's a um, one here, this one here, they was a, a two-month-old female with a mother noticed a orbital, a lump but just below the, um, around the left orbital region here, increasing in size and it was smooth and firm. Just in here, we can sort of see a relatively well-defined one. There was no vascularity there. And this was thought to probably be an epidermoid cyst. This one here was a 50-year-old that had a painless labial lump. And in here, again, we've got a really relatively fined heterogeneous sort of appearance, um, but it's hypoechoic, no vascular area there. And again, it's um, this is an epidermoid cyst there. Okay, so this one here is a 60-year-old. This one here is a, a typical, typical schwannoma here, new tumor here. So these tend to be solitary, but they can be multiple. They appear as well-defined hypoechoic masses with sort of a um, low-level internal homogeneous echoes. The, the finding of a peripheral nerve entering and exiting the nerve, the nerve, um, ex exiting the mass just in here, you can see that there and here, is the key to this diagnosis. Okay, and they're also quite often you see sort of a hypoechoic fat around the um, entering or exiting nerve. So you've got this sort of bright echogenic triangle here, um, which is characteristic of a schwannoma here. And quite often also you can see increased. Um, through transmission deep to the tumour. You can see just in here. Um, just uh, um, there's internal blood flow quite often is common in these as well. Just so note that, that you quite often do see um, blood flow. Now just a note here, a good way to report these is to say that the ultrasound image shows a well-defined hypoechoic mass that is in con continuity with a peripheral nerve. Okay, so that's, that's really indicative of what that could be. Um, just another note that some of these can be, actually can become malignant. So look for the presence of intratumoral um, cysts, cystic areas within it, and if they, there's rapid growth. So again, this is, we want to talk to the patient, see if this, this lump that they've felt has been increasing rapidly, or um, is there any, um, has it got, had any, if they had any pain, any motor weakness, or sensory deficits. So this next case here is a... Um, is actually a myxoma, so, so you can see it here, the important thing is it's where it's situated, so it looks very much like that epidermoid cyst that we saw before, however we know that it's not in the dermis, here's the dermis here, it's not in the subcutaneous tissue here, it's below the the um, the fascia here, it's within the muscle, so this is an intramuscular mass, well-defined, hypoechoic, vascularized mass. This is a myxoma, these are benign neoplasms which can be found usually in the large muscle groups, they're usually composed of a few um, elongated or star-shaped cells lying in the mucoid stroma. They're, they're sort of characterized by expanding growth without forming distant metastases. And they're a group of benign neoplasms whose first symptom is the appearance of a palpable tumor um, whose stretching they cause is um, painful. So they actually, when, when you're stretching, stretching they cause pain. Um, um, radical resection of the, the lesion is often the, the, um, the only method that they can get, um, get rid of these here. Okay. Lymph nodes. Okay, so here we want to look at different um, lymph nodes. So these are all, um, this one here, we've got a normal small lymph node here. And here we've got another lymph node here. There's a nice important here. We've got a nice normal hilum here. So a normal or a reactive lymph node have the same ultrasound appearance. They're sort of hypoechoic with an echogenic hilus. Okay, so I've got the echogenic hilum in here with the hypoechoic um, around surrounding. Most inflammatory processes do not change the hilum um, architecture. 
these lymph nodes here um, um, are demonstrating malignant inf infiltration here. So this one here, we've got a completely quite rounded hypoechoic lymph node with obliteration of the um, hilum. This one here, we've actually got um, sort of quite a um, irregular appearing node with, with um, sort of a thickening of the nodal cortex um, asymmetrically here. This patient here is a three month old baby girl who had a large intramuscular mass here. So this is all this big huge here was a mass here, um, which we didn't know what it was, it was on ultra, on um, biopsy, it was proven to be a myofibroma, which is myofibroma, which is a benign fibrous, fibrous tumor and commonly seen within the first two years of life. But again, the appearance is a pretty non-specific non and could be seen with a number of sarcoma and all those sorts of things. Desmoid tumour or a benign fibromatosis in the upper arm here. So these are tumours arrive from fibroblasts and they can be slow growing or extremely aggressive. They don't metastasize but can be really quite locally aggressive, really rare. And um, they're benign fibrous proliferations at the musculoapineurotic sites. So they're most common in adults aged between 25 and 35. They're typically hypoechoic with possible acoustic shadowing and they get, you quite often see flow on colour Doppler or, pulse, or power Doppler imaging. Um, sometimes the extra abdominal desmoids are characterised by aggressive infiltrative pattern, so an ill-defined border is, a, is, is demonstrated in this one here, quite ill-defined and, and um, speculative. Um, extend that goes through the fascial planes sort of, and sort of get like right little wee fascial tails. Okay, so sarcoma, this one here is a mixed cystic and solid intramuscular mass. Um, this was a high grade, this one here was proven to be a high grade sarcoma here. So although the majority of the soft tissue masses are benign, it's important to consider malign malignancy in the differential diagnosis. So most sarcomas present as a painless mass. Um, the main thing that the clinicians must watch for is signs suggestive of a malignancy, which are large size, rapid growth, and location deep to the fascia. Okay, so ultrasound is actually quite accurate in the deep diagnosis of sarcoma. This image here demonstrates a malignant um, leiomyosarcoma of the wall of the greater saphenous vein. So you've got this hypoechoic vascularized mass um, with a patent vein. Okay, when they arise from a major blood vessel, the symptoms of a vascular compromised, um, you can get symptoms of a vascular compromise or leg edema, um, as well as also get neurological symptoms because these quite often compress the adjacent nerve. Okay, so this is a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Um, it's seen in the upper leg. So this is a really an aggressive tumor and this accounts for about 25 to 40% of all adult soft tissue sarcomas. And this one here is a melanoma metastasy in the groin. So these commonly appear as a well-defined sort of rounded lobular hypoechoic mass. Um, color Doppler flow is quite variable, um, but it's usually pre present in the um, superficial mets. Sometimes you can see calcification or ossification, um, and they de may demonstrate heterogeneity in necrosis, necrosis apologies, and may be associated with hemorrhage. Um, also, you can sometimes see satellite metastases and lymph node involvement, so check um, away from the area of the palpable mass that the patient's felt. Um, usually the um, metastases and recurrence appear hypoechoic. Okay, just to sort of summarise that up there, so ultrasound can conclusively confirm the size of a lesion and its relationship to other structures. It cannot give reliable information on the underlying pathology and clinicians should not be falsely reassured assured by ultrasound findings. Ultrasound can confirm or exclude a mass. It can distinguish solid from cystic. Ultrasound, ultrasound can provide supportive evidence for lipomas, however should not be used to definitively characterise a solid mass. Beware the diagnosis of a, an organising hematoma. Um, note a biopsy if there's any suspicion that it is a, um, something that it's going to be a nasty mess just to, um, for seeding. Um, and just, re just to recall there, ultrasound is more readily available and cost effective than MRI. However, MRI is often needed to, to um, differentiate our findings. Thank you and I hope that was all um, helps, helpful for you guys. Um, any questions, send me an email.
Thanks.